Hey everyone, last year I made a video talking about big books I want to read and, uh, and some of the issues around the trepidation uh, that some of us readers can feel, even though we're very dedicated readers of approaching big books because we know that it's going to be a large time commitment of weeks or even months of just reading one book uh, when we have a whole shelf of books that we want to get to. Um, so that's a, it presents its own special kind of challenge and I had sort of thought that like the best thing to do to to read a, a big book and and stay with it is uh, to read other books in between you know to maybe read a few chapters and then read some other book in, in between um, but actually I think from my experiences last year of trying to read some of these big books is that's a slightly foolhardy plan um, that it's probably better just to stick with that book and commit to it because when I read Duck's Newbury Port, I read it all in one go and I wasn't really reading anything else while I, I was reading it. I was just read it over very dedicated, like I think a slightly over two weeks time. And, uh, and I felt that really worked for me. Um, but then another big book I was trying to read and which I still want to read, I was trying to read other books in between and that just meant I got distracted from it and didn't want to go. So one of the reasons I wanted to make this video and talk about it now is because um, as Anna James reminded me recently in a video I made with her uh, that I have not read Wolf Hall. So I have now started finally reading Wolf Hall, um, which I was always slightly nervous about because it, it is such a, a long book. Uh, it is uh, 650 pages long, um, but also when I started it before, I, I just got confused by the historical events, like it, they, they seemed a bit too complicated um, and yeah, I just didn't want to be going to Wikipedia all the time to, to get into it. Um, but so I finally started it now and I'm 150 pages into it and I'm really enjoying it. And I know that's partly because I read a biography about Thomas Cromwell at the end of last year. So I understand the events around it much better, even though that that biography was really laborious to read. But actually now I understand uh, all of the, the context of, of Cromwell, like closing down some monasteries and his interactions with the um, the with Henry VIII and uh, and the the sort of power play with the, um, the the cardinal he was working for and all of that so now I understand all the historical context and I can just enjoy the story and the characters and her beautiful descriptions I'm really getting into I mean she's just such a wonderful writer so yeah I'm really enjoying this now but I'm going to dedicate myself to finishing reading this before starting any other books because I think that's really the best way to do it. I mean, I don't know what, what you find, um, but I think for me personally, that's that's probably the best way to go around reading some of these big books. So I want to um, talk about some other big books I want to read as well because also like after finishing this, um, there is also Bringing Up the Bodies, the, the next book in this series, um, which I, was it, is slightly shorter. Um, this is only... 400 and let's say like 485 pages long so you know a snip compared um, to, to Wolf Hall and some of these other books that I'm going to be talking about um, but yeah I'd, I'd, I'd like to continue with this um, as well after because obviously the third book in the series is coming out very soon so um, so you know if you combine these books together uh, that is yeah, quite, quite a, quite a big undertaking. But, um, but you know, she's such a great writer. I think I'm gonna enjoy being immersed in this this whole world. And then, obviously, I haven't looked how long the third book is yet, but, um, but I'll be wanting to read that quite soon when it's published at the beginning of March. Um, so the the book that I sort of uh, got distracted from reading last year, but I want to go back to and that I want to finish is The Eighth Life um, by Nina Harashvili. <laughs> it's a really difficult Georgian name to, to pronounce. Um, but yeah, this is a very long novel of 935 or 40 pages long. 
And, uh, and one of the reasons I want to go back to this is because the long list for the Booker International Prize is going to be announced very soon. And I have a sneaking suspicion that this has a very good chance of being on that. So I, I want to go back to this and finish reading it. I mean, even if it's not listed for that prize, I want to finish it because I was really enjoying it. This is how far I got in it. Um, it's a great family saga up over the course of about 100 years in Georgia um, as it goes through many political changes and uh, talks about this this family life um, who are involved in a chocolate business and this chocolate is meant to have sort of almost magical properties to it that um, make people addicted to it and uh, and it makes a very successful family business and uh, yeah so it's a it's a very um, sensual novel um, as as well as great sweeping historical epic and and I love big family epics so um so yeah I'd like to finish this soon and another book which I is another very big book that I think might be listed for the Booker International Prize is The Catholic School by Eduardo Alban Albinati and uh, and this is the biggest book on my list it's huge this was published um uh, around I think the summer or autumn um uh, last year and, uh, and it was only just translated into English, though it did very well in Italy. Um, it won an award called the Primo Strega Prize in Italy, um, which is apparently one of the most prominent book prizes in, in Italy. And yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, over it's 1,263 pages long, so quite an epic. And uh, yeah, so it's, it's, um, it's about, it takes place in 1975 and concerns three young men who are neo-fascists and who are um, arrested and tried for, uh, for uh, att violently attacking two girls and, uh, and raping them and torturing them, and one of the girls dies. And, uh, and so it, it, um, it sort of follows that whole case and the trial. Um, but I think it's sort of a mixture of styles of writing that it's sort of um, fiction, but also some nonfiction and some slight memoir um, attached to it where uh, the, the author explores why uh, fascism continues to uh, be on the, the rise or, or be a continual thing in society, um, as well as looking at masculinity and different issues to do with that. So it sounds like a really great subject, um, has a beautiful cover. Um, but one of the issues with these big books is that um, uh, is is uh, um, they're not available in audiobook at least yet. Um, this book isn't available on audiobook, and neither is the is the Eighth Life. Um, so um, and I am partly reading Wolf Hall on audiobook, which I think does help because it means I can read it more continuously throughout the day. So I'm, when I'm at home, I'm reading a physical copy of it. But then when I'm out walking about on my commute to work and stuff like that, I'm listening to the audiobook of it. And then I'll just, you know, catch up to the page number when I get back home. And I find that works really well. Um, and, and also the audiobook of this, um, several people have recommended the audiobook to me. And it, and it does work really well because of the, um, the, the way some of the characters are drawn dramatized in the audio of it um, works really well so um, so yeah so I'm enjoying that and um, but but yeah it does make it a challenge with these other big books which aren't on audio yet and you know and that was an issue with Ducks Newburyport which isn't available on audiobook yet um, but I, I just had to read the physical copy whenever I could and obviously it was a big heavy thing to carry around and, and I know there was a big thing on Twitter recently where um, somebody, a publisher, <laughs> um, posted pictures of how big books like this, he'll cut them up and he showed the cut up copies um, just to make it more easy to physically transport them. And, you know, and I, I, I don't think that's like sacrilege or anything, but at the same time, you know, I, I personally can't do that. I, I couldn't do that to books, you know, even even if it's a proof copy like this, which is meant to be disposable, I, I um, yeah, I don't think I could 
cut it up like that because it just I don't know it just uh, it, it feels uh, it feels um, too destructive <laughs> for for me to do. So um, so it's interesting how Ariel Bissett also made a video about this recently, talking about the issue of reading big books and and how it's something she's always been slightly scared about as well. But how there are a number of uh, big books she really wants to to read, and one of the books um, she listed that I also want to read is Dune by by Frank Herbert, um, his classic sci-fi novel. And this is a novel I already talked about at the beginning of this year of classic books I, I want to read, um, but which is also quite a big book. It's 592 pages long. Um, so, uh, so yeah, and I do want to try to get into some sci-fi and I think reading some classics is a good way to do that and obviously Dune is a much lauded book. Um, I had one of my ex-boyfriends, he loved this book, it was one of his favorite books, um, but I never read it. Um, but this is available on audiobook so I, I would like to, to, uh, to read this on audiobook as well as getting a physical copy to read. And, uh, but another um, book which has been on my shelf for ages and that Ariel Bissett also talks about in her video is Murakami's um, I, uh, 1Q84, um, which is actually in two books, um, but I have an edition, this beautiful edition, um, which combines the two books to, together. And, uh, and yeah, Murakami is a, a writer that I loved early on in my life and, and read a lot of, but then, um, yeah, I just haven't read any of his books for, for ages and ages. So I'm sort of curious what I'll make of him now, if I'll still enjoy his, his work. But um, yeah, this is quite long. So this is 623 pages in, in total. And the story concerns a mysterious woman who is on a top secret mission, and then also a man who is a sort of wannabe writer. So it sounds a very familiar sort of Murakami territory. Um, though I am slightly nervous about reading him because uh, Claudia on her channel, booktube channel, Spencer's Spinster's Library. Um, she made a video recently um, talking about men writing horribly about women. And of course, Mirakami is notorious for the, his descriptions of women, kind of icky descriptions of women. And, uh, and also she, she um, cites a quote from, from him, um, but also um, from the novel Dune. So, um, so uh, it'll be interesting to see if I can pick out those passages and, and, uh, and descriptions, because I think when we encounter some passages like that in, in novels, we can just sort of pass by them or, or sort of flip by them, not really think about them. But um, it'll be interesting if I can sort of stop on them and pick that and think like, wait, what is he saying? This is ridiculous the way he's describing women in this way. But anyway, um, I, I do want to, to try him again. Um, then a, another big book that I've been wanting to read for ages and has been on my shelf for so long is this novel called A Book of Memories by Peter Nadas. And uh, so this is 706 pages long. And um, this has been on my shelf for so long, like uh, probably 18 years or so. And I first um, heard about it because I went to, many, many years ago, um, before she died, I went to uh, a discussion um, with Susan St Sontag um, uh, where a talk she was giving and um, and she recommended this as as a book that she um, thought more people should read and so I was like oh if Susan Sontag recommends it I should go out and and read it and um, so uh, so yeah and but because it's so long it's yeah it's just sat, sat on my shelves ever since then um, but this is one that I would like to tackle and read um, so it it has quite a uh, I think like the Catholic school has quite a um, interesting structure to it. So it takes place in Istanbul and um, concerns three different first-person accounts. So there's one account by a man um, who is talking about how his family's life changed in Istanbul over um, the, the course of his generation, where they, they used to be quite a wealthy family, but then um, they became communists and, um, and how that changed the whole dynamic of his family and their relationship with money. Um, uh, but then this, um, this man is also writing a, a novel um, in the first person. So there's that account. Um, but then there is a friend of this man who also gives his first person account and gives a different perspective 
on that man's life. And so I think it's um, sort of playing with these ideas about truth and, and how believability and, and whose story are you going to believe. Um, so I think it goes between these different first person accounts. Um, and yeah, and this has a really interesting, big epic, great epic novel to me. Um, so yeah, this is one I want to tackle as well. But, uh, but yeah, like I said, I think with all these books, I'm going to try at least, uh, I know it'll take a lot of willpower um, not to, to get uh, diverged and, and want to try to read something else while I'm also reading them, but I want to try to be really dedicated and just read them all the way through um, before going on to read something else. So that is my plan. Let me know uh, if you have any big books that you've been wanting to read but are have just sat on your shelf for ages and you've been slightly too intimidated to try, um, or if you've read any of these books that I've talked about, um, what you think about them. And uh, yeah, just in general, if you have any strategies for reading big books like this, um, what, what, how do you how do you go about reading them? Um, do you read other books at the same time? Do you try to just listen to them on audiobook? Or yeah, all of that stuff. And uh, let's have a discussion in the comments below. So I'll speak to you again soon. And uh, yeah, happy reading, everyone. Bye.